um, bring communities together, having those same conversations, and um, really to develop community and a synergy there. So we brought the idea to the artists and um, luckily they agreed to collaborate, which I think is important as well. Um, not only in terms of collaboration between the artists, but also the artwork, right? How does the artwork talk to each other? How does it um, work juxtaposed with other artworks? And what can happen when you have that collective kind of um, exhibition? So again, this is a little bit unique in that we have a collective, a collective understanding, conversation and purpose. So hopefully you enjoy it and um, they will discuss their process, their intent, their purpose, and the research behind their work. So with that, I will pass the mic first to Sydney, and then we'll go down the line and allow everyone to introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sydney Summy, and like, as you know, I'm one of the four artists you showed here. Um, I do uh, film photography and painting. I'm Kirsten Nimi Benedetti, and I have the portrait installations. And so I, my work is merging storytelling with portraiture. Hello, my name is Chineze Opoloka. Um, my installation is Black Girl Miracle. Um, I'm a painter, um, more recently a photographer, um, and I'm constantly asking and answering questions about identity, Black girlhood, faith, um, and different things like that through my work. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie Davis, and my work in I collaborate with Blizz. So Blizz and I both, our piece is back here in the corner. And um, my piece is titled Feral Mother Domestic Instinct and it involves painting. I, I see myself as a painter. I'm not usually an installation artist. So it was great to be able to um, explore with that with the show. And so yeah, I incorporated furniture, um, a rug with my paintings and kind of created a room set with it along with the sound. So. Yeah, I'm I'm Blizz Wilcher. I am the sound artist collaborator with Katie. Um, I'm a musician and sound artist, and this is my first showing. Um, so I'm really happy to talk with everyone today. Hi, I'm Dr. Acuff, Dr. Joni Acuff, um, and I am a professor and a chair of the Department of Arts Administration, Education, and Policy at OSU. Um, I'm so happy to be here. It's not often I get to engage with um, art making and artists and um, to kind of conceptualize it and talk to the artists. And so um, I'm kind of an artist myself, <laughs> although I don't, you know, um, exhibit it, but I can definitely appreciate the process. And I'm really happy to be here to talk, talk to you all through what was going on. Keep going. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So um, I'm moderating, um, and I do have notes that have an 18 font <laughs> because that's where I am in age um, and and memory. Um, it went away along with my abs for for the last few months. Um, <laughs> so I'll be, um, I'm not a big fan of reading, but I, I have taken great care to look at all of you all's work. And I really wanna be thoughtful about um, what I offer and how I kind of guide the conversation um, to be reflective of um, the themes that I see coming out in your work. So um, I wanna start out I'm, I'm gonna read a little bit, but I wanted to start out um, the conversation is in this vulnerable way and talk about how I entered the work. Um, hopefully this sets the stage for a vulnerable com conversation. Blitz, you said you ready to, what did you call, what did you say? Are you ready to uh, interrogate. interrogate? I'm like, this is a conversation. It's not an interrogation. Come on now. So are we artists in here? We aren't like lawyers. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to share that as an audience member, I did come in with um, a both and experience. Um, and in that I felt um, both joy and grief. And I'll say, um, that I experienced joy because the women exhibited in this show, um, I can see myself, our shared experiences. 
um, the lived experiences just based on our positions in the world and the solidarity brings me joy as well as a sense of community. And while I'm not a sitter, I wasn't a sitter for any of these images, any of these artworks, I do, my, I do see myself as a muse uh, for these artists, if only because of those shared lived experiences that connect us spiritually and um, emotionally. And simultaneously, I felt grief because I'm continually reminded that I don't have autonomy over my own body and mind in ways that other bodies and minds do. And this particular fact is not only situated around gender, um, but also about race as well. And we've experienced all of the, the social um, conditions that lead us to believe such, right? And then further um, reflecting on the name of the show as far as it being tapestry, narrating a new thread, I was reminded of the way that fiber artworks hold a particular a particularly special place within the intersection of art and material culture because of its roots in craft and early stories of black life in the Americas. Um, historians note that before access to formal Western artistic traditions was made widely available, fiber was available for manipulation by black women particularly. And it holds a multi-purpose legacy as a medium associated with beauty and functionality. And so to use tapestry as a descriptor for how you all um, quote unquote honor the beauty and the power of you all's experiences through art and storytelling and the display of visual images of being a woman in the world, it's, it's in line with the ways that fiber arts and particularly things like quilts and tapestry served as an integral, integral part of survival, collecting, organizing, economic advancement, even in artistic resistance, specifically for black women. So to follow this emphasis on media, start out with you all, um, and the ways that certain material functions to tell a story or to empower or to even organize movements, I wanted to ask each of you to share how you identified which medium would tell which story you wanted to share. So you all use so many different modes of aesthetic communication in your work. So like text and painting, photography, um, um, mesh together, juxtapose. Um, so how they're, they're so multi-layered. So using all of these things, what what was or is your process when you decide which elements would tell a specific part of the story for you? Because these stories are multi-dimensional. Well, I guess I have the mic. Uh, I was asked by Katie um, to collaborate with her uh, in sound. And I think um, as like a material uh, or like an in installation, um, the combination of sound uh, and physical. Um, well, I guess like sound is also physical, but you know what I mean. Uh, that's always been really interesting to me. And um, I think Katie's description of her work uh, before I even saw it was really um, inspiring. Uh, to bring sound to and support kind of her story. I'm kind of like the team player a little bit. Thanks, Bliss. Um, for me, material, for my work, I use pretty much all the textiles and the fabric that you see in my work has, all of it has been used before. The bulk of the work in my painting I got from my grandmother's house. My grandmother recently went into assisted living and I was given bags and bags of, tablecloths, curtains, nightgowns, all kinds of things that w my family was going to give to Goodwill. So I took it. And so that kind of answers, that was how my starting point was my materials were these um, fabrics. I'm also a painter. So my color palette, all that, those fabrics and those textiles really formed my story. So um, both from my, my family narrative, because my work is very much about motherhood and generations and feminism and the female experience, um, so yeah, I feel like those materials really played a central part. And when I picked those, so they all had a life. I have like my great grandmother, my great grandmother's lingerie is in one of the paintings, a flannel nightgown from my aunt, um, 
curtains that I grew up with are cut up and um, a lot of the animal heads are old curtains from the 1960s. So the materials are very much a big part of my work. Going down the line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so a little bit of background on me. I'm a child of two immigrants. Both of my parents um, migrated to uh, the US from Nigeria in the early 90s. Um, and I often describe my upbringing as feeling like I straddled the Atlantic, kind of like growing up in a very Igbo culture at home, but then like learning quickly how to to adapt um, like outside of the home. And I think um, in a lot of ways that sort of um, duality of my identity development has um, expressed itself even in my art. I feel like there's like a natural, um, I guess, adeptness is that a word to, <laughs> to like moving through different mediums that I just enjoy. Um, I feel like I've always experienced art in that way as like each discipline is sort of its own language. And so um, I'm constantly thinking about like, what would this story look like? What would it sound like? What would it feel like, you know, um, using different mediums? And I'm, I'm still sort of exploring ways to do that more um, through my work, but I, I feel like that's, um, a bit of uh, what influences sort of how I approach telling a story. So my work is very conceptually led and I have tried to be an artist that starts with a concept and then um, learns how to make that happen. And, um, and with my work being storytelling, um, I start, I, I felt the need to not only, I, I wanted to start by having the people tell their own stories. And so I, that, that material had to come through video and, or audio with some of them. And then starting with their stories, it, it led to, um, in incorporating different objects. So a big part of the this body of work being of women who moved to America, I had asked in the interview process to have them bring at least three objects that they brought with them to America. And I was really fascinated with the 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 hierarchy of possessions when someone's life has to be condensed into um, a weight and a certain size suitcase, and that it speaks a lot about who they are when uh, and what they value, you know, what comes with them and what makes the cut. And so um, I tried to incorporate all, if not all, then most of those objects in some regard into the elements. Um, and then in listening to their stories, the materials just came out. And so there's greens in a lot of uh, the piece, and those are from their stories and how that grain um, in, in most of the stories represented a, uh, a resilience and a kind of ingenuity specifically within the female line. So often something that their mother did in order to help the family economically, and they would be paid in this grain. And, um, and then most, you know, it, it, the, and, and, and then in trying to include, um, some kind of fiber, especially in one of the pieces, um, her culture is Berber and it, they, they communicate through their fibers and every color is, is symbolic and every stitch and design is symbolic. And so I just needed to include some kind of, um, of their fibers. And so fortunately she was going back to Algeria and I was like, sweet, I'll give you money and you can get me a belt. And so I was able to include, um, one of her belts in there so that you can, cause I mean, images just can't capture the richness of the fibers there. Um, and then the reason why I chose oil painting to actually depict the portraits was a reference to, um, the tradition of oil portraiture being reserved for only the most elite, um, the wealthy, the famous, the people with all the power. And so translating and flipping the power structure into taking these women whose stories and whose image are not often being reflected in the, the broader narrative um, to say, you know, they are worthy as any, probably more than most people in history have had their 
their pictures painted in oil. Um, and so that's why I've chosen a more traditional format for the actual portraits themselves. Um, so for material wise, um, so I have two sections for my part in the gallery. Um, photography wise is a timeless love and then painting um, is my uh, Women of Tomorrow series. And when starting with the materials, I think it has taught me really that the realization of intention is not always what I think it's going to be. Um, so when talking about like the different colors and this spilling of um, painting, I started out like experimenting on a blank can canvas before I even thought about portraiture. Um, and I slowed down and took the time to go back to some photos that I um, took of the 2020 Women's March downtown. Um, and I don't know why I did it, but I went back and started painting on top of the um, spilled orange and black and turquoise um, uh, work that I did before. And I was like, oh, this looks pretty cool. I think I <laughs> kind of like this. And how am I going to now turn this into an intentional thing um, with the other works? Um, when it comes to realization of intention for my photography, I think I go back to the camera that I use, this 35 millimeter camera that my dad actually gave me my freshman year of college when I was a painting and drawing major. Um, and it's my great uncle Jimmy's uh, camera. But and I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. Um, it's just sitting on my desk. And it was just sitting there for like a year or two. And then he took it back from me because I wasn't using it. Um, but, you know, then switching my major because, you know, realizing that I need to be in photo, like really shook me um, into taking black and white courses. And, you know, now coming full circle and having a gallery with, you know, film work in it, it's kind of like, wow, you know, I didn't realize at the time, but, um, I don't know, it purpose is a funny thing when you, you really don't know uh, what you're doing at the time. And I know I'm even speaking to myself now uh, <laughs> with a bunch of things I'm thinking about, but um, yeah, I, I, there is some digital work like probably for in um, those, but painting wise behind the photos uh, as well, thinking about the color and what that means um, as like a royal color as, you know, speaking to my black community, speaking to myself and valuing um, ourselves when other people really don't and seeing them in more of a divine light than we're not often shown in. So, yeah. Thank you. So, I mean, my interpretation when I'm in, engaging in the works, um, the way you all describe the um, intersectionality of not only the um, materials, but the subject matter and how you came to it. Um, I definitely felt that when I like walk in the space, when I, my first in engagement with it was online. Um, and even that aspect was interactive. So I really appreciate all the different um, ways that um, aesthetic languages were used because, you know, if you aren't familiar with one um, medium, there's another just waiting for you to for you to tap into. And so um, I think that's very representative of of women and the intersectionality that we have to um, work through as far as our gender and specifically gender and race intersections um, as they relate to different marginalizations and oppressions, et cetera. So all of that came through. I'll just let you know that. Um, so I wanted to, I'm going to ask each person some questions, but um, it was so interesting because as I was teasing through each work, a lot of you all stuff overlap. And so please feel free if you, if one person is speaking to, if you feel like you have something to contribute, you can tap in and um, add to it. And I'll kind of nudge you too, because I'll be like, well, your work did that too. What do you think? Um, so I'm going to start with, I'm going to ask you to pronounce your name again because I don't want to get it wrong. Chineze. All right, Chineze. So 
um, going to your artist statement, um, you wrote, Black Girl Miracle is an invitation to reimagine our personal histories, an observation of what it means to feel at home in one's body. That gave me chills. Um, a reconciliation of childhood of the childhood selves we have either outgrown or been forced to abandon and you also say this project has a restorative lens and so um from my own research and my own background and just my lived experience um your your work reminds me of black people's desire to move from resistance to existence so not always having to be in um, a fight but just living and breathing and just being um, and their desire to know what black existence means without the mediation of whiteness and maybe even the mediation um, without the mediation of womanness. So when you think about your the conceptualization of your work um, and its power to explore this existence beyond the burden of having to prove blackness or womanness, how do you see your or do you see your work as being that like trying to mediate the gaze um and just situating yourself in um who you can be without that that lens that we have to walk through each day on a day-to-day -day basis and it just being you or, or just the the subjects or the objects of your work yeah um I think I believe it's Toni Morrison that has a quote and I'll paraphrase it but she talks about racism as like a distraction like you go to like prove um, or disprove every like accusation against um, who you are, your character, your worth. And I think um, in my art, I very much, although it may do that, that's not the focus or like the way that I approach my work. I think, um, as you said, like shifting from resistance to existence, that's something that I grappled with um, even in recent years, like with 2020 and like, you know, conversations around um, racial identity coming um, to a head, if you will, or just being more at the forefront of um, our culture, I was asking myself, like, how do I, as an artist, kind of like participate in, in this moment? And I think, um, you know, there were a lot of things that the, the city was doing to like, kind of try to, to help artists engage in those conversations, like they had the um, murals downtown that we like painted and I painted like a couple of them you know but I was like I don't feel like this sort of um, maybe like reactionary space is necessarily where I feel called to as an artist um, and I feel like some of that is just with personal convictions that I have I think like beauty um there's another artist, Theaster Gates. He says, beauty is like a basic service. Like what it does to someone to behold beauty, to become beautiful, to see yourself as beautiful, I think is very liberating and something that I um, desire to do through my art, even when I am, even in like, you know, when I'm touching on or addressing um, content or stories that are essentially artless or gruesome or challenging to kind of work through. I think that, um, what I aim to do is provide like a, a beautifying way for us to like look at maybe some of the ordinariness of our lives and see it um, through a new life, through a new light. Um, and so I think in that aspect, I definitely, um, I feel like that's kind of my lane as an artist or what I desire my lane as an artist to be um, is giving people, Black people, especially um, space to breathe um, and to not be confined to kind of this like monolithic narrative of of our lives. So Kirsta, is that how you say your name? Okay, all right, Kirsta. So in your artist statement, I'm going right to y'all's words, right? <laughs> Um, you write, this work is an opportunity to give women the power over their own story and how they would like to be seen and known. So um, this proclamation for me sends me to the work of Patricia Hill Collins, the feminist 
um, one of the foremost scholars in Black feminism, and she introduced these actionable goals specifically for Black women, which included their right to define themselves, establish positive multiple representations of themselves, and use their cultural heritage as energy to resist daily discrimination, and also confront interlocking structures of domination like race, gender, class oppression. So from this frame, I see your work as an emergent articulation of this. Um, specifically, I don't know if you heard of the, the um, text, This Bridge Called My Back, but it's um, third world feminism. It's a, co a collective of narratives around just experiences of women around the world, right? So um, it explores these complex intersections that deal with not only um, an American lens, but an international lens, um, which should not be conflated, like there are different experiences globally. So how does capturing you in your in your body, I'm not sure what your ethnicity is, but you read white. Um, you, phenotypically you read <laughs> you read white um but how was how was it for you in your body capturing these women um specifically those that you called you say are you know underrepresented and marginalized and have not been at the fore of uh representation um how did you feel personally and how did you reconcile your position as being the person who is placing those narratives on in on display, right? Um, and you use a lot of material and a lot of their own things, but I, I just wanna hear from you how you navigated that space between um, self and working with these spe this specific demographic and population of women. Yeah, so I love this question because it allows me to discuss the intentionality that, that comes into my work and in, um, acknowledging my, my heritage in being white and my white privilege and my white gaze. Um, and so coming from that knowledge, I have been, the intentionality has come from uh, making the work as a relationship and a collaboration instead of, you know, I am not the expert. They are the expert. They are the expert on themselves. They're the expert on their culture and their faith and who, how they want to be represented. And so I saw my job more as a really good listener and an explorer of them. Um, and as a way to spend my white privilege on their stories instead of my own. There's enough of my narrative out there. There's enough of, you know, my position and my culture represented. And so um, I would rather participate in another form of representation. And and you had talked about the, um, uh, I forget exactly your wording, but um, it, it made me think about um, the value, not only in representation, but in dimensionality. And so giving, um, you know, not just one picture, uh, and, but a story objects, all these and videos, um, all these elements so that there is dimensionality and that most of the images given to, if there are given to these women would, would often be one dimensional. And so giving them the right to have multidimensional complexities of, you know, hopes and dreams and, and desires and, and disappointments, um, and giving them the room to do that and the value to being able to express that, um, and so a, a lot of the intentionality all, also comes into from the very beginning in being not it, giving away a lot of my power as an artist. And so they each subject has um, the right to, you know, I, I ask permission before using images, before using items, uh, especially religious items, because I'm not of the religion. And there's been many times where my great artistic idea ended up being very offensive religiously. And so, um, you know, establishing that trust as a collaborator and giving them the authority in my work to say, you know, this is because this is representing you, you're the authority. And they were able to say, you know, actually, that idea doesn't quite work for for me or my faith, you know, and then being like, great, then I it's my job to figure out a way 
to represent you the way you want to. Um, and they all have power over their images, the items that are used. Um, they have veto power even to the end with everything. Um, and, and, and then also trying to step back in, in, in that my ideas are not, um, you know, the forefront of the pieces of the value, you know, of, of the product. Um, I would probably add, um, as she is speaking, you talked about like the, um, the d dimensionality of the women and like speaking to their like hopes and dreams. Um, and that just kind of made me think, um, even like with your work, you talk about like what they had to bring and what they had to leave behind. And it makes me think, um, tying back to your question about like survival and um, resistance that so much of what we leave behind sometimes are our dreams. And I feel like art um, kind of allows people to get in touch with them again, um, to um, yeah, connect with their dreams um, in a way that's not so short-sighted. I feel like when you're surviving, you don't really have time to think about um, anything beyond like the next moment, the next minute, the next day. But um, I feel like art invites people um, into that process of being able to dream and think more broadly about what their lives can become. It's wonderful. Um, so I, we, yeah, similar to that, um, piggybacking off of that, another really key intentionality from my approach is the questions that I ask to solicit their stories are strengths-based and not deficit-based. And so, um, I want the, I want them to feel really proud of what they share and that they don't need to elicit any specific feeling from anyone, you know, they don't have to share, they don't have to be known by the most traumatic thing that's ever happened to them. They can be known by their hopes and dreams and, and giving the opportunity to, to let that be displayed and be a key element of them instead of just, I'm a refugee and I was born, you know, in the middle of war and, um, sure that's a part of who they are, but that's, that's not all of them. So being intentional about not trying to solicit, um, you know, more deficit framing in that way. And looking at those videos um, that accompany them online, it was really um, nice to see the questions. They were so simple um, from like knowing their favorite color to um, just what makes, what's most important to them. Um, it just ran the gamut. So I really appreciate it. Just the simplicity of just being, um, without having to think about that resistance all the time. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, I wanted to ask, all, all of you can you know, address this question, but um, do you, it was a follow-up to your, um, your work about thinking about your work as an interventionist piece, like an activist piece mm -hmm. um, to support the voices of the, the people, the participants who you are, who you are using as muses, right? So um, do you see your work acting in, in, in interventionist ways that disrupt narratives um, or do you just see it as um, something that, like, what do you hope the audience what what the what do you, do you have hopes for the audience to be moved in certain ways um when it comes to your work inter being an intervention for certain narratives about the the people who are in who are highlighted in the works um yeah so definitely i see my work as doing that um with my paintings because i titled it the women of tomorrow it's kind of like um, I don't know, just memorial memorializing these women before they're gone. So kind of not waiting like years and years and years uh, for them to do something what, you know, a mass amount of people deems as great or waiting until they pass on to see them and to hear them. Um, I find that happening too often in the people that we study in school and to the people that uh, get document uh, documentaries, you know, done about them. You're like, oh, like they're amazing, but, <laughs> but we waited until they're gone to like see them and hear them. Um, and their small acts of just showing up every day and like marching um, in protest, like those are 
grand things that I think should be uh, seen. For photography wise, I definitely think it's an intervention as well when uh, talking about the narratives of how black people are seen um, and you know how from the outside, are not seen as the most soft people, are not seen as the most loving people, or have an attitude, or because we have certain um, physical traits aren't the most loved or loving. Um, but from a person within that community, I've found like the most loving people, the most soft people. Um, and no matter, because most of my um, photos over there are of strangers. Um, but like having this connection to another person simply because we look alike and have maybe the same stories that aren't the same, but have a similar, you know, cadence to them. I want to interrupt it through like a shared intimacy, um, though it may be through struggle, seeing that beauty as well um, that, you know, people might not often see. I, yes, and, and a reason why I feel at home with these artists is because of that dynamic that I feel um, in their art. It's, it's a lot of artists don't use art as um, activism. And so it's fun to find a home with others that do. There's such a power in art. Um, and I realized early on specifically the power of portraiture and realizing that it it's a great merging of something I love doing and I'm interested in people. And yet I can also use it as a tool for power um, to disrupt narratives, to introduce um, different perspectives. And it can be confrontational. And I think in some ways the work might be for some people, but um, I, I use it more as an invitation, that it's invitational and to step into. And uh, I also see it as um, a way of lessening the emotional, um, the emotional taxation of the people whose stories are being told, that I can do the legwork, that they can share their story and then I can amplify it so that they don't have to use um, so much emotional energy to get their own story out there. And so I hope to be just that tool that can be that and to enter into spaces that they might not be invited into. Um, and so that also is part of using my own privilege that I might be invited into spaces they're not. And then it's like, well, surprise, I'm bringing it in, <laughs> you know, I'm opening these doors for them. Yeah, I think um, in a very like practical way, the just even the representation of um, black women in paintings and behind or like in front of the lens is um, an act of resistance in the sense that like we've not always been the chosen subjects, you know, for these different um, media. And I think, you know, with painting, um, depictions of like black women throughout history were very hell bent on telling a very narrow um, story. And then even if you think about like just the advancement of photography, like the ability for them to pick up, uh, pick up our pigment, you know, through colors and like the tools that are available for us to represent ourselves beautifully through these um, different methods, I think is in itself um, activism. And then I would also say that um, I also, in the way that the stories that I tell come about um, is disruptive in and of itself. It's not, um, I feel like it's really important for me to get close with my subjects. A lot of the people that I depict or photograph or um, the stories that I tell are people that I'm actively doing life with. And the story came about because we were on their couch eating ice cream and it led into another conversation and they may not have seen that there was art there or necessarily thought that there was a story of this memory that they were recounting but um, I think that that's something that's important for me is to like be able to draw that out of them um, in a way that doesn't feel contrived or like forceful um, yeah so those are those are kind of my my initial thoughts and then the last thing I'll say too is um, just thinking about um, giving voice to people to share their stories. Um, 
you know, they often talk about like being a voice to the voiceless. And it's like, I mean, you, you've been holding the mic. That's why they seem voiceless, but they actually have something to say. And so creating a platform for other people to um, be able to um, just engage in self-determination and um, decide what stories are being told about like themselves, their culture, their families, their lives, I think is really important. Um. Yeah, I think for my work, I feel like my work is a little bit, um, I, I've never seen myself as an activist as far as like my art, but I think being in the show has been awesome because it's forced me to think through some of that stuff for my own work. Um, I think where my act of resistance through my work comes is being very rooted in the fine art world. Like I teach at CCAD, got the MFA, and I've been in this art bubble and so many times you go into these galleries and you just see the white walls and there's a painting on a white wall. And I love this show because we all like, we all painted on the walls and did all this different stuff. And I feel like, um, oh, and also one thing I wanna share is when I was in graduate school, I had this professor he, who um, was scoffing one day, to, he was really highbrow and saying how, well, yeah, you never wanna make your paintings where you don't wanna cater to those women who match their furniture with a painting. You don't want to do that. Like it's just, that's not um, the kind of painter you want to be. And I just think that is so elitist and so not. And so of course my brain was like, well, yeah, I kind of do want to do that. <laughs> and, um, so slowly over time, I feel like every show I've had in the last two years, I've painted on the walls. I've interacted with other artists and had beads in one show. And this has been the most involved I got where I literally was like paneling a whole room and everything. But I was more resisting, thinking about, I feel like in the art world, there is this, the term decorating is really like, you don't want to be a decorator. And I feel like I love being in a home that is decorated. And I love, like, I grew up in a farmhouse. My family only had one bathroom and we were pretty crowded. And I just remember my mom could make a space just be so magical with just opening windows and lighting a candle and putting some flowers on the table. And it would just like reorient the whole space or the way of, the way the furniture was arranged. And when I was staying at home with my kids and um, didn't have time to be in the studio and I was yeah, I was, I had this creative, creative energy that needed to get out. And so the way I arranged my furniture was important. It was just a creative outlet. So I was constantly like painting on walls and moving things around and that's decorating your home. And that's a creative outlet. And so many women have done that over the years, men do it too, but like so many women have created magic in their homes just by the way they decorate. And so I just wanted to honor that I'm a painter and I want, I think I'm going to keep, um, I guess, I guess that's my resistance is I'm questioning like the white walls and why art has to be seen in galleries that way sometimes. And, um, just wanting it to have, yeah, more of an inviting feel. I don't know if I answered your question, but yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's a super interesting question we've been discussing. I think I tend to be more like pessimistic when it comes to like art and activism. I can definitely like easily see how art is political and how art uh, reflects political realities. Um, but when does it go the other way, right? When does art influence uh, the body politic? Uh, you know, when I think of structure, when I think of systems, those are extremely resistant to change. That's the whole thing about them. Um, and so, you know, you think like maybe, I mean, it's made up of hearts and minds. And so I think like if in any way our piece has an activist component and maybe my contribution to that is to make it as psychologically impactful as possible um, to kind of reveal within yourself the feral. And, um, you know, I think the feral is definitely really um, a strong motivator for political action. Um, even if, you know, it's not necessarily like pointing in that, in any like explicit direction. Um, but yeah, hopefully it achieved that. It did. 
And I would, you know, say that it is interventionist work, um, which brings me to your question, Katie. Um, so your, you know, you talk about decorating um, and the materials from the bags of clothes, mm -hmm. which, um, you know, if we're thinking about it artistically, those things came from our material culture from your um, historical lineage. Um, even the name to me is intervention. It's like, it's like a double side. Like it kind of dares you to be both things at the same time. And it's like acknowledging that I'm more than this one thing. Um, and this other thing can be quite scary. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and that's okay. You know, that's, that's who we are. Um, so your work tends to be multidimensionality, tends to the multidimensionality of humanity. This is my interpretation. <laughs> and the material contributions of a lived experience, which you affirmed that when you said where you got all the material from, mm -hmm. um, specifically one that's situated in womanness. So, you know, your grandmother's um, linens or cl the clothing. Um, and so I'm going to read this definition of material culture and ask you, because you do mention the idea of feminism in your work. Um, so if material culture is the good, the study of goods, objects, and the built environment that focuses attention on consumption, trade, and the intimacies of daily life, which I see were in your, in that bag of things that, you know, helped you build that. How would you tease out the idea of a feminist material culture? Like, is there a different? Is, should it be differentiated? Is there um, something that a feminist lens brings to uh, material culture that you think um, can be seen in your in your work specifically? Hmm. Can you like further maybe clarify yeah, so, that a little bit? <laughs> so if we think about like American material culture. You know, yeah. you, the, the things that could pop in your head, like, yeah, like maybe all the, flags, all the stuff, stuff, the stuff, stuff that you know represents who we are so yeah. but when you're thinking about when you're thinking about this question comes from my um development and co co-development of a black feminist material culture mm -hmm. um thinking about the ways that black feminism um is used to tease out material culture in a way because it was needed um based on the fact that black people didn't have a lot of things mm -hmm. to uh, to have to associate their culture with specifically um during slavery there you mm -hmm. know we didn't have material things so mm -hmm. our material culture became these more t um experiences it became the way we talk to each other it became mm -hmm. Um, the groans during conversation it became the way the, the way that we cook different foods mm -hmm. right um and so we have these kind of um material culture items or material culture experiences that are beyond the actual um tangible things yeah. and so when you think about feminist material culture I'm kind of giving away yeah. what my thoughts are <laughs> but I'm but I'm thinking like for you do you think that they're like yeah how do, how do you Feel like a feminist lens um adds to the idea of what a material culture is i i mean i guess i would say it's not so much about the materials it's about the arrangement and about the what you're using them for mm -hmm. and how the person the user in the space or maybe possibly a family or how like it's not just there and you didn't just buy it and you have it it's how it's used and um so i think that would be more like the use and the arrangement um, I don't know if that answers the question. I mean, I, yeah, back to what I was saying earlier, like I, I didn't grow up with like a lot of like new things. Um, but I think I felt very safe in my home and there were a lot of blankets and things around me. And I think, um, yeah, I think it's just more, I th there, there is an attachment and I just think we all are humans. We touch, we smell, we see things and we feel things. And just those childhood memories of being like in a blanket or in a towel or like whatever you have, like we all have those experiences. And um, so, yeah, I think, I guess the feminist idea is not so much about what you buy or consuming. And I use a lot, like 
it's really sustainability is really important to me and like using things that already have had a life that I'm not buying brand new things. And so it's not so much about consuming and what you have and all the material. It's more about using things that have had a life before and maybe being attached to those things and keeping them with you and not just consuming, consuming and buying new all the time. I don't, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> It gave me information. <laughs> okay. All right, great. Which is all that we, you know, come to talk about. <laughs> um, all right. So um, how are we on time? Do I have enough time for one more question? Oh, okay. All right. So I'm gonna jump to Sydney. And um your work has a lot of bell hooks quotes, and that's my that's my that's my woman. Um so um I wanted to ask you about love because that is at the center of your um artist statement. Um and I'll just share a few uh, some additional things um that Bell Hooks introduced the concepts introduced that Bell Hooks introduced to me. So love is about witnessing the spiritual, emotional, and, and intellectual growth of a person. And I do see those that in your work. Love is a capacity to enter imagin imaginatively into the minds of people with whom you don't immediately agree. And in a podcast, she says that anytime we do the work of love, we are doing the work of ending domination. And so in your own work, what do you believe the work of love is? And in what ways do you see your artwork actually instructing your audience um, about what the work of love is? Um, so yeah, I think, first of all, like I, from the very beginning, I didn't set out to connect with bell hooks the way that I am right now, or go on this journey of questioning what love is. Um, but in the work of love, I feel like is really a feeling of death <laughs> of just like, dying to yourself over and over again and like having a willingness to change and a willingness to learn um I feel like um in her first chapter and what I am learning as well is differentiating um what she uses as the word cathexis and what love truly is so like um that work affects us being a, the deep feeling, um, just having like a feeling for somebody and confusing that with the true meaning of what love is. And um, if we can differentiate that difference um, and go to the real meaning of love, then we can love other people better. So I feel like um, on in this journey of loving and finding out what it is, I think it's like doing away with like, I don't know, all the butterfly feelings that we think it is within a society that just tends to romanticize everything. Um, so like, you know, I'm a, a girly girl. Love, I, hopefully I want to be in a relationship one day, but I, you know, it's not going to be solved in an hour and 30 minutes. Um, or like the man of my dreams isn't going to sweep me off my feet or love isn't just within that one realm. What is it like to love somebody who offends me? What is it like to love somebody, even like people and family members that are closest to me that is hardest to love so I feel like that um vocabulary is very limited when we just see it as this surface level thing that can't sustain um life <laughs> and, and the ups and downs that we go through with people um I think it's also challenging us to like act as well and not to sit on our hands and just, you know, wait for somebody to, um, I don't know, put a ring on my finger, <laughs> quite frankly, but um, also pushing me spiritually to be like, okay, like loving someone is be sometimes being angry and like, working through that like feeling everything that I feel but then responding in a way uh that is loving so yeah thank you um you want to open the floor for questions from the audience
I do have a final question if y'all don't, but I see some, I, I got students in here, and you know, I will call on you. <laughs> Um, I'll start out since I have it, but um, I feel like from start to finish, um, just like hanging is just such a laborious process. And I know you guys know this, um, but it's just like, even thinking about my work about love, it's just laborious. It's just like, it's not pretty, like hair is out, I'm sweating, I'm, you know, I need a shower at the end of the day. I got, you know, my other interns when I worked here helping me sweating and stuff like that. But I feel like, um, get, you know, having what I am given, working around it, finding out, you know, different problem solving, um, techniques to make this possible, asking for help, um, being willing to like, do math over and over and over again <laughs> when you're trying to figure out like the spacing on a wall is not simple um but and then being willing to like even put in work that you know you're not comfortable with <laughs> putting in work with you know painting wise I didn't those weren't supposed to be in here um but yeah just a space of un being uncomfortable but seeing the beauty in that at the end of the day So having work that is interactive and installation work is inherently interactive and in that, you know, it doesn't exist until it's installed. And, um, this work it's, it's one of those, it's a risk, um, putting it out there, but it also, the work doesn't completely exist until it's interacted with. And it, I love how little control I have. Um, that's one of the reasons why I love interactive artwork. I also have been most changed by interactive artwork. And so I, I strive for that. Um, I actually love edible art. It's like one of my favorites. And I was trying to really figure out a way to make edible art in this. And, um, and, and so installing every time that I've installed the work, um, you know, there's, there's always this question of, you know, how will it be? engaged with and especially having like I've tried to explore because I have different elements and video and all this stuff um there I've tried to explore kind of how to um invite and encourage people to engage beyond just what they're looking at and I'm gonna have to continue to do that I've learned from some other the other artists of like some different modes of inviting people into that engagement. Um, and I'll continue to grow with that. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it, it to me that the installation is the, the exciting part and it, and everything starts from there. And that's when I start to actually see the work come alive and be out of my hands. Definitely. I feel like um, the process of installation um, causes your work to like materialize in a different way. And so for me, it was intimidating because especially with the way art exists now or is mostly shared now, it's like, yeah, I could post it on my website, you know, digital portfolio, social media, but even thinking about like, what, what does my art look like um, on canvas or like printed, like, will it reflect what I hope that it is reflecting? Like when it kind of exists in that physical way. And then I think as much as um, I desire for my art to be an invitation, you do have a lot of influence on how people move through the space and like what they see first. And, and so kind of like answering those questions as I was um, putting up the work was uh, challenging for me to be quite honest. And then I think, um, 
I haven't had a ton of experience exhibiting my work either. And, and so it kind of is always, um, always a, a learning process um, and causes me sort of to like grapple um, and wrestle within myself about what I'm trying to accomplish and, and just even finding my footing as an artist, I think, to your earlier question about like, whether we see our art as disruptive or um, an intervention, I was kind of reflecting, I was like, I mean, I feel like just my persistence in being an artist feels like that sometimes, um, especially because I feel like I have a, I feel non-traditional, I guess, in the arts world, like my, my nine to five, I work in finance. Um, and then like I, but I'm very committed to um, creating work as my five to nine, if you will, and have been trying to find that space as an artist where it it does feel like a sacrifice to keep creating in the way that I am but it's one that I know is necessary for me to even be happy you know um and so I think in that sense um just the grappling about like what's considered legitimate like if I do it this way is there a right way to do this I don't know but this is what I like or this is what I'm what feels right um I think those are questions that I'm constantly thinking about um and presented with when I'm like working through like installing my art as well. Yeah, I think for me, something I've learned through showing um, this particular show is that there are a lot of feral women out there. Um, <laughs> I feel like people, I wasn't sure if people would get that whole concept that I knew was real for me, but I feel like I've had a lot of mothers specifically be like, I get this, like, and they'd explain what their thoughts were and, and they completely understood what my piece is about. So I feel like that's something I've learned. Um, I've also learned that I like working with furniture. Um, I've loved the interaction with the, have the audience interact. I wasn't sure people would know that they could sit on that love seat, but they really did. And so I feel like people have known that they can sit on it and hear the sound. And I really love collaborating with Blizz. I've never incorporated sound. And so the whole sound collab has been really great just because I wanted that multi-sensory experience for the viewer. I also learned that I love wood paneling. So that's the other, I love the work with the wood paneling. So uh, yeah, it is material culture. So yeah, I'd say those things. And also just showing with these other women, I think it's pushed me as an artist just to maybe write more about my work and think through some um, things on where I'm going next. So it's been really, really great showing with you all. So. Yeah, I actually found um, like maybe this was a weakness of my contribution, the installation aspect, because um, for my part, I just kind of sent over a file and, you know, <laughs> hope it worked out. And I checked in on the volume, but this was actually a conversation we were all having, like whether, because, um, the, so the sound shower that it comes from is, uh, it isolates the sound, but also we wanted to make sure like people could hear it at the same time. And so figuring out something that's proper to a space like this, which is kind of cavernous and reverberant. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because I can hear it right now, right? And, um, you know, if you were viewing, uh, anyone else's piece, you could probably hear it um, at this volume, um, depending on, you know, how many people are in the space, how many people are talking. And, um, you know, in some ways, that's a good thing, right? We're all in conversation. But in other ways, you know, you want to be able to, like, isolate uh, as you're viewing another person's artwork. So I think that's something I'm going to bring forward if I do more installation stuff is that, like, um, consider you know, all sorts of other possibilities, sound dampening, um, you know, headphones, or I don't know, sound is really challenging, because it depends on architecture as well. And I don't think architecture is, sound is really um, unemphasized, you know, people, I mean, that's like the sound in any space uh, really impacts your experience of being in that space. Um, and yeah, um, that's something I've learned. <laughs> I think also sound depends on um, who who you are too, and like your your comfort level with being reflective in in a quiet space or in a because when I think about your room and like the the volume, 
it reminds me of my house. Like I can just watch TV and my kids can be screaming. I can still hear the TV because I've drowned them out. <laughs> so, so it's a skill to be able to, you know, separate that those two um, kind of aesthetic experiences. Um, and you're right, there's some feral, <laughs> some feral mamas out there <laughs> with a lot of feral kids. <laughs> Um, I'm Staver, S-T-A-V-E-R, on uh, Bandcamp and SoundCloud. Um, unfortunately, I'm pretty active on Instagram. You can find me at um, K Davis Studio on Instagram. And also, I have some flyers in this area that you're welcome to take with you. It has my website and a lot of that stuff on it. Um, my website is chinezexo.com, C-H-I-N-E-Z-E-X-O.com. Um, my Instagram is the same handle. Um, and then I'll be back in this space actually Saturday doing a pop-up shop. And then at the end of the month, um, doing like a dinner party um, if you want to connect with the work in that way. My website is kbenedetti.com. Thank those Italians, B-E-N-E-D-E-T-T-I.com. And my Instagram is um, Kirsta Nimi Benedetti. Um, and uh, I, there's a whole nother element to my work that, or a collaboration that I have done with a researcher. And so if you all have not already, it would be hugely uh, in, helpful for myself as the artist, for the future of the work and for the research that's collaborating. Um, I do have a little piece of paper around with QR code to participate in a like a three minute survey about how the work impacted you. And so this will give us evidence evidence based practice to the power of art and portraiture and storytelling. So that would be awesome if you could do that. Um, so my website is sydney-elise.com, S-Y-D-N-E-Y-E-L-I-S-E.com. And then for my art page, it's creative underscore vessel underscore. And you can reach me there as well. Um, I also have an interactive piece uh, for you guys on the table over there asking you the question of how you'll move forward in love. And I'll collect all those responses and make them into a book. So I'd really appreciate that as well. Um, I just want to say thank you for like this, this, this exhibition was a, a nice puzzle that I feel like fit together. Um, I can from the panel, um, your responses, I can see you all learn from each other, which is the greatest gift that an artist can have in, in an experience is to be able to learn from um, other creatives. And um, I learned a lot from you all. So thank you for allowing me to experience and ask you questions and facilitate a dialogue. All right, sorry. So I do want to thank the panelists, the artists, our moderator um, for doing this. It's not easy to be vulnerable and discuss your work. Um, it can be challenging. So we appreciate that. Again, this show is up until the 27th. Um, so and we'll have other things coming up as well. But um, this is really what we're about here at Urban Art Space. So arts research, right, um, done in a way that is responsible and responsive to the community, um, doesn't look at participants as subjects, but more as collaborators. I think that's important to, to make known. Um, exploration, experimentation, collaboration, um, trial and error, and you know, just pushing the limits of art and how we look at it, how we engage with it, how we um, deconstruct it, deconstruct it, decipher it, all those things. So um, you can visit our website <laughs> um, or you can just Google OSU Urban Art Space and you can see the list of our exhibitions, upcoming events, and all those things. So again, thank you for coming. And um, I think we have maybe 10, 15 minutes before we close. So feel free to view the artwork, speak with the artists if they want to stay 
um, our moderator if she wants to stay and ask any questions. So thanks again.